Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I now call to order the resumption of Monday night's meeting of Planning and Development Council of the Town of Oakville. And um, I'll turn to the Commissioner. Commissioner, now that you've had some time to reflect on all that staff uh, were given by way of information from the public, what advice do you have now for Council on how to proceed? Well, hopefully I can find my presentation faster than uh, Monday, but, nope. Ah, you're there again. Everything is done. Darn it. I just put it on. Oh, you put it on. Yeah. Yeah. Downtown next to us. Thank you. Yeah, Mayor and members of council, we took stock of what we heard on Monday night. Um, there was a lot of information that was provided through that session. And I think to, to summarize the key points that we heard from that discussion, I think was that um, there was a desire to get more of a public opinion or consultation that was more town-wide. Um, so to ensure that we covered the town as a whole and gathered as many as opinions on the downtown uh, cultural hub master plan as possible. There was also still some discussion about whether or not we should proceed with the decentralized or the centralized or the dispersed or the centralized model. Uh, there was uh, concerns we heard about the selling of the town assets, and I think especially around the uh, Centennial Square. Although not explicitly stated, I, I, we didn't hear, we, I think implicitly we heard support for the downtown as the cultural hub, but certainly the financial arrangements or the funding arrangements needed to be sorted out in a lot more detail to understand those implications. On the um, lakeshore or the road side of it, uh, we did hear the need to find a solution for the interim parking for Lakeshore. That needed to be solved and fairly quickly. We also heard, particularly from the BIA, that uh, they needed some additional time to discuss with their uh, membership in terms of which of the Lakeshore options in terms of timing they would support. But they did indicate that certainty was a key uh, and so they needed to determine which was the better time, sooner or later or a hybrid in between. We also heard, particularly from the BIA, that a permanent parking solution is required and it is required soon. And we heard support for the retail action plan. So taking into consideration those comments that we heard, and there were a lot more, but I think these were the key ones that impacted the four reports that are in front of you. We're suggesting that these following next steps that you could take on the downtown plan. The first is you have item number four, which is the downtown plan implementation report. Um, and you could defer item number one, uh, which is the item that deals with the, uh, referring to the budget, all of the items for Lakeshore Road, the conversion, um, the funding for the Performing Arts Center, and the funding for the market testing and the, uh, the overall program to find partnerships. You could defer that to November 2nd. There's a Planning and Development Committee meeting. It's in time enough to um, make some decisions around those items. Um, so that the Budget Committee has that information for their final de deliberations in December and then their recommendation to Council. In terms of the second recommendation that was part of that report, we're suggesting that you defer it and that was the recommendation that dealt with the, the market sounding um, and proceeding with that, but you defer that decision until March. And at a March meeting, yet to be determined the actual date, we would bring back to you uh, three items. One would be the results of a public opinion survey. So we're looking at a variety of ways of collecting um, the, the opinions throughout the town. There is a survey which we're able to undertake. Uh, there are some um, a tele town hall meetings which is still a random sample which we can get some more information because it is a fairly detailed subject to try and understand the ins and outs of it. We also can use our website and overall mailings to the town as a whole. So there's a variety of ways, new mechanisms we'll use in order to collect some of that public opinion and bring that back to you in March. The next one is that we can also bring to you some of the earlier feedback that we're hearing about the downtown review. 
We are scheduling a meeting, looking to schedule a meeting in November, so it gives us an opportunity to hear from that and bring some of that back to you. And the last thing we'll bring back to you is that overall program to find partnerships. So we had suggested the market sounding as a first step, but there are subsequent steps after that. So what does that look like to give you a better understanding of that overall program? So that is the suggested next steps for item number four. Item number five is the downtown cultural hub. We're recommending that you defer consideration of that report to March. Um, then you're not making a decision on the key elements until you've heard those other elements at that meeting and you can consider the uh, downtown cultural hub at that time. On the downtown parking strategy, which is item number six, uh, we are recommending that you receive the downtown parking strategy report and that you direct us to get on with looking at the interim parking solutions. I think that report, report referred uh, us to be looking at it when we come back with the design. We're recommending that we move that timing up and actually come back in the spring of 2016. That gives us an opportunity if there's any um, budget implications then we can understand those so that we can build it into the budget for 2017. And the last recommendation I think the action plan was uh, supported, and so we're recommending that you approve the staff recommendations on that report. Thank you, Commissioner. Council, other questions? Councillor Elgar. Thank you uh, very much. I think what you're putting forward is very reasonable, and I'm gl glad to see that. Uh, just one question is regarding our budgeting for 2016. When would something be coming back as to what mo money you think you, you would require in 2016? for uh, consulting fees, I'm thinking, where I think we were, we were talking um, initially, I believe, $1 million. And I just wonder, is that what you, like, for the budget committee, which will be meeting and everything will be approved in, you know, before the end of December this year, I just wonder what the numbers you're thinking we would want, want to put in the budget. So the recommendation that's in the capital budget is for the million dollars for the overall program. Um, at this point in time, we're recommending that you one, consider that further first on November the 2nd, but it gives you the opportunity to understand that um, in relation to the rest of the budget schedule. So we are recommending that we budget for the opportunities to look at the partnership arrangements in their full spectrum. Um, but of course, as I think we had indicated on Monday night, the first portion of it is a small portion, about 100,000, I think we've done a little bit more refinement on those dollars. Um, that we would need for the market testing, but we budget for the balance of it. We wouldn't move forward with the balance of it until actually council had received that first report and uh, approved the next steps. Okay, I appreciate it. I guess we'll, we'll hear more on November probably also. Will we on this? I, you could, yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Adams. First of all, thank you very much for your time that you gave me today to go through some of this uh, deferral motion uh, concept and uh, tweaking it as we had the discussion today. I, I appreciate that. On the issue of the, the one million dollar uh, funding, one of the things that we talked about that I wanted to share with Council was a concept of breaking that uh, million dollars into two pieces and allowing us to consider the implication of spreading it over two years between 2016 and 2017 should we wish, which would allow something else to move forward into the 2016 year uh, in effect to switch the, the funding envelope. Uh, with that money. Uh, so that's one of the things that we can consider through the budget process. So we'll look to our staff to provide some options around that when it comes to the budget recommendations in the end of October, which will be in time for us to start considering the implication um, in November. Uh, and apart from that, I appreciate the material here. On the public opinion survey that uh, we discussed, uh, there is some consideration there around what should be asked. and. I think our council here should give you some feedback, I think, on what issues might be relevant for them uh, to hear through that opinion survey, whether it be a um, telephone survey or an in-person survey or uh, whether it be a focus group. Uh, one of the things I'd like to make sure that we consider is the, uh, the understanding of the public of the, of the boutique concept that wasn't fully explored in the current report and whether that's still something that people think we should consider going forward. 
Um, certainly through you, Mr. Bear, we can include those uh, elements into the uh, survey. One comment on, uh, after some further thought on the boutique option, um, simplicity on the survey is probably going to be key so that it's understandable as it goes out to people. Um, and we need to also keep in mind that the theatre option is quite some time away. Um, so that gives us the option, even when we're looking at the type of theatre, to also then put on the table the boutique. So we'll have some consideration for trying to keep it simple and recognizing that some of those broader discussions, such as the boutique option, could actually be considered at a later date. Councillor Giddings and Councillor DeMoff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I certainly support the suggestions and the timing that's before us. Thank you. Uh, in terms of soliciting further feedback from the residents, uh, we received the information from 450 people the other evening. Are those the types of questions that would be asked? I, I just hate to see that data be lost mm -hmm. and not be able to be used. Don't want survey fatigue to set in and have people say, I've already filled out the survey. So just wondering your thoughts in terms of whether the information that was provided could be dovetailed into whatever we ask for. It is possible we were going to ask uh, the residents associations if they could provide us a copy of that survey um, so that we could understand the questions and a little bit more detail on the data so you would also perhaps have some of that in front of you in March. Um, but also to understand the types of questions they have so that we could build it into the survey. Um, our thoughts at this point in time is that we retain uh, Polera, who d is the uh, firm that does our town-wide work. Um, so they're familiar with the types of uh, questions and the way in which you've asked the questions. We'll work through them to design that questionnaire. They'll have in mind what the Residents Association had done. We'll provide that to them. Very good, thanks. Councillor DeMoff. Uh, thank you very much, and I like the direction you're going. When you're doing a survey, though, how will you frame the question and so that people um, have the option of saying, no, this isn't a priority, because there's a huge cost involved. So I, I don't want people to think it's a done deal and pick one of these options. So how, how can you frame it to get in the, um, we're going to be spending a lot of money to do this. We don't know how we're going to pay for it. We don't know how we're going to pay for the operating, but make a choice based on, I mean, how do you, how do you frame all of that? Because depending on how that's framed is also going to determine your answers. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be frank, I'm not a survey expert at all, and I think that's where we'd rely on Polera. Um, what I'd suggest is if you, I mean, your comment and question about how you frame it to get at the issue, um, it's really the issues we need to understand so that we can present them to Polera so that they can help design the questions so we, we can get the right responses back. Because one of the things I noticed on the residents survey was that really it was the waterfront that there, there mm -hmm. was really high on their list and the actual cultural hub part of it was pretty low in comparison to protecting the waterfront and access to the waterfront. And part of that could be not understanding what the other, the other involved. Mm -hmm. But it, it was pretty clear that was the big focus, not all of the, the uh, cultural hub part of it. So uh, it goes, just goes back to how, yes. and Polera is going to be taking direction from us in terms of what we're looking for, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Councillor Lischina. Uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, and just when you say town-wide, uh, is that by ward? Are you going to have information from each of the wards? Is that what we're going to give direction to Polera about? Yeah, I think when we've done, through you, Mr. Mayor, when we've done surveys town-wide for the citizen survey, we've looked at taking a random sample geographically throughout the town, um, and geographically in terms of the, of the demographics as well. Um, we usually require about 800 response, a minimum of 800 responses <coughs> in order to make it statistically valid, um, but that would be drawn from the town as a whole. And we could categorize that information geographically um, when we come back with uh, information in uh, March. Um, Councillor O'Meara. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Commissioner, the, the one thing that, you know, obviously we want to get information from a survey from Polera, and, and I understand, um, you know, uh, 
the thresholds and the numbers and that sort of thing. But the other thing that I think is important to do by getting a survey out uh, is informing the residents. Mm -hmm. So so getting a group of about 1,200 people uh, at a random sampling, well, yes, you get a, a vague idea of what their thoughts are. Um, I would hope that the sampling would be much bigger in, the, uh, in an effort to ensure that residents across all of the town understand what we're talking about and what's going on. So it's not just trying to get uh, a random sampling of people to have an opinion on this, but it's also an effort at the same time to educate and to notify uh, residents um, in, in a way that we haven't been able to, I think, with this issue so far. So I, if that could maybe be brought to Polera as well, that it's, we don't, I know it costs more money to get a bigger sample, but uh, I think it's part of our public notification uh, uh, element as well. And through you, Mr. Mayor, I think we're actually looking at using not just a survey. Um, so survey would be one tool. Another tool is to, because the survey you need to be simple um, in order to be able to convey the information and get the results back. Another uh, tactic we'll look at using is uh, something like a, uh, um, a tell a town meeting so that people would be called randomly and call into that to be, get a little bit more detail uh, in terms of the responses back. I think we'd also look at communicating more widely throughout the town in terms of just getting general information out uh, we'll look at the option of even doing a door-to-door -to, -door, um, to see the, the implications around that. And then through that, we can drive them into the website uh, in order to um, look at uh, providing some comments through the website. So I think right now we're looking at a variety of techniques in order to pull the different um, uh, conversations in. Councillor Hutchins. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, on item number six, your recommendation to receive the report, and uh, I think it should be done so, but uh, I wanted to clarify, does that then cement just that the two options are just gonna go forward, or will you, will you be looking at it in more detail and maybe looking at tweaking them? Um, the parking the garage or the option two, which is the underground things? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the uh, recommendations that, or the options that were considered in the parking strategy uh, we looked at as background um, uh, options that could be considered as we moved into the phase one of the downtown cultural hub. So with the deferral of the item five, which is the cultural hub, uh, the permanent parking solutions uh, would wait your, your deliberation in March in terms of how we look at solving that parking, permanent parking problem. Thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Grant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, I'm actually really glad to hear that you're not just doing a survey. Uh, I'm just hoping, though, that before you go forward to Polera or whatever you do, that we can get a look at it. The, the concern that I have with surveys basically being, well, from my marketing background and focus testing, the results you get are usually from people who want to go to focus testing or, survey, or take surveys. And uh, it would be good if we got more of a randomized approach, or at least perspective, than just people who may have a vested interest in seeing things go one way or another. So uh, some of the tools we've used in the past are good, but if we can find different ways of approaching people, that would be even better. And again, I, I'm really pleased to see the uh, residents group come forward with their results, but if some of the questions we have are similar to what they've asked, I, I still think it's valid that we go ahead and use those. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lapworth. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hey, I appreciate we've just issued the uh, fall edition of Let's Talk Oakville, but based on the timing that you need the results of this particular survey, would the next edition of Let's Talk Oakville be uh, an adequate way of communicating to the residents? Or could we put it in their next tax bill? Um, I don't really have an answer for you at this point in time. I think we'd look at the tax bill as a way of getting it out. We're also looking at the mail. We could look at the timing of the Let's Talk Oakville to see whether or not that fits the timing. I think we, we had thought about doing it in stages so we could get out in November with the survey element and then follow up with the more uh, detailed pieces into January. Reporting back in March, uh, we'd need to start to close off that consultation about the middle of February um, so that we could get the information compiled and back to you in enough time. Thank you, Council, for all your questions. Um, uh, if you are satisfied with the recommendation, we just need a mover. Councillor Adams moves, and uh, we don't need a seconder because we're still in Committee of the Whole. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, and that does carry unanimously. Thank you, Council. 
Now, Council, the next item before us is item number eight, but in terms of public interest, I think item number 10 might be the next uh, in terms of degree of interest. And I know we have two delegations here on item 10, and so out of consideration for them, I propose, if you, if you don't object, to move to item number 10. Councilor Duddick? Actually, there's somebody here on item number 8 as well, so. All right. Uh, Madam Clerk? We were unaware. Uh, Councilor Adams? Um, you didn't uh, ask for declarations of pecuniary interest, and I did declare at the last meeting on Monday an interest, a non-pecuniary non interest in item C1, which we dealt with on Monday, but this is a continuation of that meeting, so I'm going to reiterate it for good measure, uh, and that is that my brother is employed by one of the companies that was named in the report in C1, uh, and it's not a pecuniary interest because it's not covered under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, but it is covered under our Code of Conduct, so I am mentioning it uh, for good measure. Thank you, Councillor. So, Council, um, uh, let us turn then to, to item number eight and in response to Councillor Duddick's note. Is there a, a member of the public here with information for Council on this item? Councillor Duddick, do you want to assist us? Yes, sir. Would you, would you like to come down and introduce yourself and share your information with us on item number eight? Good evening. Pardon me. My name is uh, Adrian Latavsky. I'm with the planning firm Johnston Latavsky Limited, and we are the planning consultants working with uh, Sagio Investments, assisting them through the condominium approval process. And uh, we are here, of course, in support of the staff report. And uh, it's been a, a long process to get this through the development process, and we're happy and eager to see it complete. And uh, I I'm here to answer any questions that may arise. Uh, I understand there may be another delegate here to speak to the item, and so I make myself available to respond either to Council's questions or to any other questions that may come up during your consideration of the item. Thank you very much. Why don't we check and see if there's anybody else before we occupy your time. Is there another person here? Yes, sir. Would you uh, like to take his place and bring your information for Council? Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Worship, and good evening, uh, members of Council. Uh, my name is Kevin Thompson. I'm a, a solicitor for Stefano Fava and the estate of Rosa Fava, who are the residents or the owners of the property immediately adjacent to this proposed development at 66 Stewart Street. Uh, there's been an ongoing dispute between my clients and the proponent uh, of this uh, draft plan of condo. Uh, we are asking at this time that you defer uh, granting draft plan, plan approval. Um, I'll take you through just some of the issues that are outstanding, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, historically, between these two properties, uh, there was a mutual driveway. Um, there was a, a dispute at the Ontario Municipal Board back in 2001 uh, that led to minutes of settlement actually being signed between these two parties, um, dealing with a proposed easement on the condominium side of the property uh, for driveway access to 66 Stewart, Stewart Street. Um, over time, it's become clear that uh, there are potential issues uh, with this agreement being carried out uh, in the, the manner in which it was foreseen when it was drafted. Um, notably, the grade of the, um, the condominium side appears to have been raised, uh, making the driveway itself uh, functionally useless. Um, this is a concern that we would like to see addressed um, before this uh, committee grants provisional uh, approval or or grants uh, draft plan approval to the proposed condominium. Um, driveway access to 66 Stewart Street is crucial. Um, and until that issue is resolved, um, it's, uh, I, I feel that there will be a, an impasse and a and continual um, um, infighting between these two, uh, these two owners. Um, there's also an issue with the sewer line for 66 Stewart Street uh, just this week. The proponent began repairing it uh, at the behest of the municipality, um, and that's an ongoing process. We're waiting to see if that's done properly and if there's appropriate sign-off um, by the, the relevant department. Um, so given the multitude of issues, again, the, the dispute over the easement and the driveway access means that the proponent does not actually have absolute title to the, to the lands in question. 
uh, meaning that that's a further step that needs to occur before this condo can actually be registered. Um, so it would be appropriate at this time to defer this application. Uh, in the alternative, uh, if you are uh, wishing to proceed tonight with draft approval, we would ask that you add one additional condition to that approval, uh, namely that the proponent be required uh, prior to uh, final approval to provide a written confirmation from the owners of 66 Stewart Street confirming that they have uh, a functional driveway uh, with the grade restored to uh, the way it was prior to ground being broken uh, on this condominium development. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. There may be one or two. Councillor Duddick. Actually, Your Worship, I have questions for our legal staff at the appropriate time. Is, does anyone have questions for Mr. Thompson? Councillor O'Meara? Just so are um, are your clients against the proposed development or they just want to see these issues get sorted out before the development goes ahead? They want to see the issues sorted out before the development goes ahead. They, they feel that there are appropriate steps that need to occur. Uh, there's been shortcomings on behalf of the developer to date. Uh, if and when those are addressed, we have no concern with ultimate uh, registration of this condominium. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Mr. Thomas, uh, are you familiar with Appendix D in the report and the list of conditions that staff had? Yes, put? I have reviewed it briefly before this meeting. And w would they satisfy your needs? These are not quite. Uh, the concern is that the staff report speaks to the easement um, issue briefly. Uh, the proponent actually applied for a, a severance to permit that easement um, almost a year ago. Um, we're coming up on the one-year lapse of the conditions on that consent. We don't know the status of fulfillment of those conditions from the proponent. Um, we have been uh, trying to push this forward, but it, there's, there's quite a history on this file. Um, I myself am newly retained on the file, so I'm trying to uh, make headway with the developer's lawyers um, to see if we can uh, get those conditions fulfilled before that consent lapses. If it lapses, then we have to potentially go back and seek a new consent for that easement. Um, and until that happens, there, there is no driveway. And without a driveway, um, the, the property at 66 Stewart is, you know, unmarketable. Very well. Thank you for that. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Oh, Councillor Lischina, do you have questions for, for the gentleman? Uh, just a clarification. So there's nobody living at 66 Stewart right now in order not to park there? Uh, there's a, a tenant currently uh, living there, a tenant of my clients. Uh, and, she does not have a car. I see. Thank you. Councillor Noel. Thank you, Worship. I'm, I'm having a hard time visualizing this. I wonder if we can put the uh, drawing up on the screen so and you can demonstrate the uh, access issue. Maybe not demonstrate it, but at least illustrate it. I'll do my best. Let's have a little the, car. And, you know, anyway. The staff are racing through their slide deck to get it for you. So I, I don't know if it's clearly visible in this overhead, and but, but perhaps if, if you have the report before you, if you turn to Appendix C, which is the, the schematic, in the very top right corner of the shaded area, there's a thin sliver uh, of a, a hash mark yeah, right where the pointer is. And that's the proposed easement, which would form the westerly half of the driveway. So the driveway would straddle the lot line between the development and the adjacent single detached. Um, so this is, the, the easement itself has been contemplated for, as I mentioned, since 2001, um, but actually carrying that to fruition has been a, a bit of a, an issue between the two uh, adjacent uh, property owners. So it, it, it is contemplated on there. The, the grade, however, of the shaded side of that driveway uh, in our opinion, has been raised to a degree, uh, making the, the driveway itself functionally inoperative. My client has just passed a, a photo up to me. I don't know if I can, if there's an overhead, if I can use this to... There is, to present <coughs> there the is screen. an overhead. I think that it's pretty clear even at that uh, resolution. 
but so essentially, which, if I which, can describe it, you're looking south at this point in time. The concrete area to the right-hand side um, is the development side. The trench you'll see on the left is the former driveway. It's been dug out just this week to repair the sewer line that was damaged as a result of this development. Um, and so I understand that's ongoing and we're monitoring that situation. The concern, however, is that prior to this excavation, the, uh, the grade of the 66 Stewart side was about a foot lower than the raised grade on the development side. Uh, so even when this is backfilled, once the sewer is uh, repaired, we're still concerned that the development side is uh, significantly higher um, and, and we don't feel that actually raising the grade of 66 Stewart um, will be an option uh, just given the foundation and the existing uh, windows and, and everything else on, on that building. Councillor Noel. Would it be possible to recall Mr. Latavsky to ask what, their, what the applicant's um, uh, plan is for this or maybe Councillor Duddick has information? I, I thought we would dispose of the delegations one at a time. Sure. And I, I thought we'd stack them up. I thought it'd be fun. I stacked them back <laughs> for this purpose. And, um, and I, I haven't really heard enough yet to, to have an opinion as to whether we should go to staff next or right. to the gentleman from Sagio. Okay, well, I would, can I just re then reserve my request to have Mr. Latowski come back to uh, potentially address this? So He's we get coming it. back. That's good. He's coming back. And the only question is when is appropriate. I thought we would, we would it's, it's Mr. Thomas, is it? Thompson. Sorry? Thompson. Thompson. I thought we would finish Mr. Thompson. Councillor Duddick. Thank you. Um, thank you for that illustration of the, the driveway. Um, we're both very familiar with it. Um, are you maintaining on behalf of your client that the grade has been raised more than what the um, drawings that were submitted to the town for approval are? That I don't know. And we, we're going to have our surveyor go out and confirm that the as-built um, either matches the site plan that's been approved or perhaps is not in conformity. I, I don't know whether that actual grade is part of the approved site plan or whether it's been raised more and uh, perhaps the proponent can speak to that more clearly. But, but either way, we feel that the grade precludes the driveway. Thank you, Mr. Thomason. Thank you, Your Worship. Listen. What guidance can you offer, Council, before we turn to the, the gentleman from Sergio? We have two conditions of interest that are included in Appendix D of the report. So these are conditions of draft plan approval. Um, number one, with respect to the grading, if something on site has been constructed that isn't in compliance with the approved site plans, we do have a condition to catch that. So that would be condition number three. Um, which states that we need certification from the owner's engineer that all grading and drainage and above and below ground servicing, et cetera, have been implemented as per the approved site plan drawings. The approved site plans did anticipate this easement. Um, so that's point one. And number two, we would maintain that condition number two provides a sufficient safeguard uh, to ensure that the easement is registered as anticipated. So in your view, the number two uh, answers Mr. Thomason's concern about uh, wanting the driveway provided for? Yes. And, um, and it's your opinion, is it, that uh, uh, it would be unnecessary to require written confirmation from the owner of 66 uh, for that, that staff could be relied upon to look after this? That's precisely what this condition is intended for. All right. Um, on behalf of council, I have to ask, is there any chance that um, um, we could wind up with a um, incompatible grade on the, on, the one, on the developed side versus the uh, needs of 66? I don't believe that's the case. Uh, the approved site plans took into account the location of this easement and would have taken into account the grades between 70 Stewart Street, Stewart Street and 66 Stewart Street. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carr, what kind of assurance can you offer Council that this, uh, this impasse can be solved? They, I mean, we're specifically looking, I think Council's specifically looking for reassurance about the enforceability of these terms. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, what you are um, observing, I think, is a long-standing dispute between uh, two neighbors, and there's actually two parallel processes at play here. One is the condominium approval process that you have before you with a number of conditions. And staff have addressed their uh, issues and concerns with the condominium application and processing the application and in adding the uh, conditions that are before you. And of course, it will be necessary for the applicant to complete all of these conditions um, in order to uh, register their plan of condominium. But even if they were to fulfill all of these conditions, they still could not register their plan of condominium until the land titles dispute is resolved. And that's resolved in another forum, and that's resolved before the director of titles at the land registry office. So that process, I understand, is underway by the landowner. And until that process is resolved, then the condominium cannot be registered. So in my opinion, there's no requirement for any additional written confirmation. The two processes working in parallel will ensure that the dispute will eventually get resolved. If I could just follow with one question. Is there therefore no need to add as a condition that the dispute before the director of title be settled before we issue uh, this approval? In my opinion, no, Your Worship, because quite simply the, the plan of condominium cannot be registered until it is. Councillor Duddick has a question. Thank you. Through you, Your Worship. Um, Councillor DeMoff and myself have been in touch with yourself and the Planning Commissioner on this issue for quite some time. Um, I think from when I was first elected, it's been chasing us. Um, my concern from the onset when this was getting to the point where the project was being completed was that we did not want to experience or I did not want to see council in a situation similar to what we experienced in a number, another part of the community where people who are wanting to register their condominium felt that it was the municipality that was sort of holding them back from that. And from what I understand from your communications, you've assured me that that being a, pl a private agreement between one landowner and another, um, that cannot go forward. In other words, it's not the fault of the municipality, but rather the fact that that private agreement has not been fulfilled so the um, title is not free and clear, in other words, for them to proceed. Is that not correct? Through you, Your Worship, that's, that's exactly correct. The municipality is doing everything it can to process this condominium application, but even should council approve what's before you tonight, the condominium, as I've said, cannot be registered and conveyances cannot happen to the occupants until all these land title issues have been resolved. And there's another forum for that, and it's completely outside the purview of the town. The other question that uh, has been raised in the past is the previous committee of adjustment and that um, the owner, 66 Stewart, felt that the town should have had more ownership or jurisdiction in um, the uh, decision of the Committee of Adjustment on this property. Uh, for instance, there was mention of the OMB decision. Now, to my way of thinking, that also was between one landowner and another, hence why the OMB decision was not something the town would enforce, but rather the individual. Is that correct? Yes, through you, Your Worship, I couldn't state it better myself. Mr. Carr, is there any jeopardy to the town if it were to defer a decision on this item for, for the nonce? Uh, through your, your, your worship, um, I wouldn't say there's any jeopardy to the town, but with respect, I'm not sure what that would accomplish. Okay. I think that um, the other process will take its course.
Mr. I'm going to struggle with your name because it's written uh, Latusk. Is that your name? Would you come, please? Latavsky, sir. Tell me how to say your name, please. Of course. It's uh, Latavsky. Latavsky? Yes. Thank you very much for the help. No trouble. Um, having heard the questions, do you have any information for counsel? Well, just to um, respond to a number of points, uh, I support staff's assessment that you've heard so far that there are a number of processes underway, and none of the issues you've heard tonight, uh, I believe, warrant counsel's deferral of this application uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, I'm really not entirely sure what deferral would accomplish, what the what we would be seeking in this deferral. And likewise, the issue really is uh, down to the resolution of the easement issue. And so the condominium approval can proceed. There are a number of conditions of approvals recommended and will then be in place. And we have, in fact, worked our way through most of those conditions of approval already. The, the, the last point that would have to be resolved is this uh, title issue and the resolution of absolute title, and I'm confident that in time uh, it will be. And so at the end of the day, there really is no reason I see for t the town to defer their decision tonight. And so on the specific points raised, uh, my client has indeed been working <laughs> as best they can to resolve this issue. I have here actually a, a better drawing, if there's any interest to see at least a better view of the sliver that's, that we're talking about. This is the uh, condominium plan right there. Not, can you? There. It's this corner right here, if you can get that. About as good as we get there. Okay. Uh, as was mentioned, it is a sliver of land. It is about uh, not quite two meters wide by about a, almost 11 meters deep. And yes, there is a mutual driveway there, and our client has uh, agreed from the beginning that there is a right for an easement over this property and minutes of settlement were signed back in 2001. And as the process went forward and the time finally came to look after this issue, uh, Mr. Fava then expressed a concern over the size of the sliver that was being proposed. Uh, he insisted that the sliver should in fact be larger, uh, a different size, our client agreed. And we, so we have agreed to go for this sliver, which is about 10.9 meters long, we came to the Committee of Adjustment in November of last year, seeking approval for exactly this, uh, exactly what Mr. Fava was asking for. Through the course of that process, there were negotiations underway to, so that minutes of settlements could be drafted where both parties would agree that if this easement was granted, then all matters between the two parties were resolved. Uh, after a number, a long negotiation actually with uh, the previous solicitor that Mr. Fava had on the file at that time, uh, an agreement was reached, and uh, our, my client executed the agreement and sent it to Mr. Fava, and he has yet to execute the minutes of settlement. That's why that has not proceeded, because we, we've offered all that he has asked for, but uh, we have not yet received back this minutes of settlement from that agreement. So in the meantime, there is another process underway that was mentioned. Uh, Mr. Fava has launched a dispute at the land, um, I understand, with the Land Titles Office with the, uh, over the absolute title application. My client is likewise doing what they can to grant Mr. Fava the easement that he has requested. Uh, he has not yet agreed to accept the easement that he has asked for. And so we are, as I understand it, waiting for Mr. The, for Mr. Fava to accept the easement he's asked for. Uh, once that's done, we'd be happy to sign that over. Uh, as for the grading issue, you saw the construction is underway. That will be resolved. My client has done what they can to ensure that driveway access is provided. It existed before. We have every interest in making sure that it continues to exist. And as was mentioned here, it was a condition of site plan approval. It was part of the grading plan as approved by the town of, town of Oakville. Um, we want to give Mr. Fava what he's asking for. 
So at the end of the day, I, I don't mean to drag this on too long, I just simply want to say that we are working to resolve the issue. We would like to resolve the issue. And in the meantime, I don't think there is uh, any reason why the town should not allow this approval to proceed. It will not in any way conflict with the other processes underway. So one question arises from what you said, and that's with regard to the grading. Mm -hmm. In the picture we were shown, the grading, that the, the concrete driveway structure that was in the picture that you, your, that, that you generally have built, is that beside the easement or on the easement? What it actually is, we always like to, it's, oh, oh geez, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting, I'm, I have to keep that there where you can see it. Um, underneath this easement is a below grade parking structure. So there is a concrete structure down there. There's two stories of parking that go all the way down and the footing and, and such as that. And that, so this, that goes right to the property line. However, what has been offered and which was, as far as I understood, agreed upon, uh, an easement at the surface to allow the driveway to continue over that structure. So it's a, a stratified easement. And so what you saw in that photo would have been the top surface of that below grade foundation and parking structure. And uh, it was designed and as approved in the town site plan drawings to be level with the driveway. And when all construction was done and everything brought back to its proper state, there would be a functioning driveway there. Thank you for your information. Councillor Duddick, do you have uh, a suggestion for council? I'd love to be able to move it, but I really can't in good conscience. I've been too involved in this that I just don't have the comfort. <laughs> All right. Council, we, we're here to make decisions, but we don't have to make the decision requested. Councillor Knoll. Your Worship, I'm satisfied with great respect to the ward councillors, and I think I'm hearing Councillor Duddick correctly. Uh, I'm satisfied with the explanation and the process that's been outlined by our solicitor um, as well as by the applicant that uh, there will be an opportunity to resolve this. I do believe it will be resolved, so I will move the staff recommendation. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It carries. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, Council, item number nine may be a, a simple motion to receive, the, the report being quite extensive, and I know you all read it. Councillor Duddick? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yes, Councillor DeMoff and I have been quite involved with the Kerr Street BIA. This was an excellent process, um, excellent uh, participation, not only by the BIA, but J.C. Williams Group. Highly, highly recommend them. Um, it was a great uh, experience, and we look forward to implementing. Councillor Noel. Um, I apologize. I should have uh, declared this earlier. I want to declare a, con a, a pecuniary interest in this item. I am a member of the uh, Kerr Street BIA, and as such, could potentially benefit from uh, the uh, suggestions contained therein. So I'm going to excuse myself from this uh, discussion and vote. We'll allow you to push back from the table. <laughs> Um, it's the, the, the receipt is, mo is moved. Uh, any others? All in favor? Opposed, if any, and that carried. Item 10 at last. And, uh, everyone who's here for 10, I, I regret that we couldn't come to you uh, a little quicker. Um, Mr. Hanna, are you starting us off or just getting the technology going? In any event, over Just getting the technology of worship. Thank you. <laughs> Almost there. We are there. Thank you, worship. Um, Mayor Burton and members of Town Council, we're here this evening for the statutory public meeting for the update to the 1st and 2nd Street Heritage Conservation District. Uh, the purpose for the session this evening is to present you with the, uh, the draft guidelines as they exist today. 
and also more importantly to provide an opportunity uh, for the residents and others in the community uh, to provide you with their comments, concerns and or support for the updated plan. And I'm happy to, uh, to see that there are a number of residents in the, uh, in the audience this evening. Before I begin my formal um, meat of the presentation, I just want to acknowledge a couple of people on our project team, uh, namely Sue Shepard, who's been the heritage planner. There's Sue. Uh, she's done a great job managing this uh, process. And uh, also with us in the gallery is Dima Cook. She's a representative of FGMDA Architects, and she's going to help me with the presentation tonight because her firm was um, selected uh, to help us with this project. So the, uh, the presentation uh, for you this evening has four main components. Uh, I'm going to provide uh, a little bit of background on the district and the initiative and some of the, the work that we have done to date. Um, a little bit about how districts function and the issues that we have been experiencing with the current plan and guidelines and why we, uh, why we started the initiative. And I'll also touch on the, uh, on the public process. Then I'm going to turn the uh, podium over to Dima, um, who's going to uh, help you understand, take you on a, a brief uh, tour through the updated guidelines and talk about um, things like property categorization, look at some of the guidelines themselves for contributing and non-contributing properties, a little bit about demolition and, and permit exemptions. And then I'm going to return to the uh, podium again to talk about some of the recent feedback that we've received and the issues that are still potentially outstanding. Uh, you have a number of pieces of correspondence, I believe, in front of you this evening uh, from some of the members of the gallery. And then I'll touch on next steps. So very quickly, very uh, briefly, the district itself, um, the Heritage Conservation District, was designated in 1988, but the plan and guidelines for the district plan were not approved in, by the Ontario Municipal Board until 1991. So in terms of a planning process, uh, we as planners like to update planning documents uh, regularly. So we've been dealing with this document since 1991, and so we're roughly uh, 25 years later, so it is time. There's 66 properties within the district itself, and uh, the current categorization system that we have in place to identify the value of the properties within the district is a one, two, three, one being the highest importance, and I mention this because a lot of effort and a lot of discussion continues to be on how we uh, do a categorization moving forward. Category one right now in the plan is highest importance. Uh, demolition is prohibited. Category two properties, demolition would be discouraged. And category three, uh, things can be demolished. So again, the reason why the plan and guideline is important because it is there to assist with the management of change within a district. Heritage conservation districts are not static documents. They're no different than any other neighborhood in the community. But within a heritage conservation district, you have a plan and guideline that's there to, to effectively manage the change within the context of the importance of the heritage uh, and the character of the neighborhood. So again, permits are required for all alteration of exteriors to the properties. Um, We've been very successful, as you're aware, over the last three years to have a, a minor and a major permit, minor being delegated to staff, so we can typically look at those things within two to five business days. Those are for small changes like changes to roof, roofing, paint colors, uh, landscaping, etc. And full permits, of course, uh, go through review by the Heritage Oakville um, Committee and also for council approval, and those are things like large additions, new garages, uh, and new homes. So the reason why we're really doing the update to the plan, again, it's a 25-year-old plan almost, and we, we were finding over the years that the guidelines are not particularly clear. Uh, the categorization, we believe, is, is out of date and, and, and a little bit fuzzy. The, the document itself is not particularly user-friendly. A lot of more contemporary um, Heritage Conservation District have a lot more visuals to them to explain uh, the guidance on what we're looking to achieve. There's uh, legislation that have changed. We had an update to the, uh, the Heritage Act that we have to consider. Uh, there's limited guidance on uh, landscaping, both on the public or on the private and the public realm. And a lot of things that we've seen, at least in my time with the community, is there's been a request for more contemporary or what we call modern materials. And right now, there's not a lot of guidance for those. And what we're trying to do is incorporate changes that would allow those. 
So what are we doing and what are we not doing uh, with this update? Uh, obviously, we're bringing the plan up to date, and it will require uh, the passing of a new district bylaw with uh, subject to appeals. And I've, uh, I've mentioned this to the, uh, to the community as we've gone through this process, because there's still concerns with the way the guidelines are being presented this evening, is that uh, one of the options is a do nothing. We just keep the plan exactly the same it is. Now, I'm not suggesting that. I think that would be a mistake. But we're trying to meet current legislation. We're trying to provide guidelines that are clear and easy to use, both for the professional community that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, but not only them, but also the residents of the community. And we want to update the categorization. And right now, the, uh, what we're suggesting is a contributing being heritage and a non-contributing being a non-heritage. Uh, uh, basically, that would be how we would categorize the, uh, the district. What are we not doing? We are not changing the boundary of the district. So the only thing that technically I guess we're changing is there is a single property that's designated under Part 4 of the Heritage Act, uh, an individual designated property, 41st Street. The time when the original uh, Heritage Conservation District was approved was at a time when you couldn't include Part 4 uh, properties embedded within Part 5, and that's what we're obviously going to be doing uh, with this plan. So in terms of work to date, this project is actually dating back to uh, 2014. At that time, we included it as a priority within our heritage work plan. And we went out to a request for proposals in the fall. And we selected the firm of, um, of and I can never get this correct, but it's FGMDA Architects. Got it again. And they've been uh, assisting us ever since. One of the first things that they did for us was they did a detailed background uh, study on the historic and architectural development within the district, and they came to the conclusion that the district still um, had merit. And that study, as you recall, was supported by council uh, back in March. The big effort, though, in this uh, initiative has been the public process, and we really got that going uh, back in January of this year. That's when we really launched it with a, with a letter and emails out to the property owners. What we were trying to do at the time was make this as uh, transparent and a, um, a, an inclusive process as we could. And we were asking for volunteers at the time uh, to join some focus groups so that we could have a more intimate discussion on the plan and guidelines as it was being created. And we really got some uh, um, good energy out of that and we had a lot of people volunteer to, uh, to take part in those focus groups. And, I, and I've been involved in all of them, and there was quite a few that were held, and I will be talking about those in a, in a second. The first focus group um, that we had was back in March 3rd, and we had separate ones with the residents within the area, and we also had ones with what we call the professionals, those being the architects, the planners, the real estate agents, people that work uh, within the district assisting the residents in their changes. And what we're trying to do is really look at two things. What are the issues with the plan and guidelines today? And try to get some early feedback on some of the suggested changes that we were looking at. Things like modern materials, should we allow contemporary design? Uh, what, are we, what, where, what areas of the plan require clarification and how should we address categorization? So out of that feedback, what we did is we, um, we prepared the first draft of the guidelines back in April. And we provided a larger focus group meeting um, April, I believe, the 21st, where we brought everybody back together again, both the professionals and the residents, to get feedback on the draft as it was today. Now, we talked about a lot of things that evening, but one of the things that came up at the time was, again, the contributing versus the non-contributing categorization. And it's been a, um, a focus of attention all the way through this process, and there were some concerns uh, raised with a number of properties uh, that evening. They were shown as contributing at that time and there was some um, efforts by the, by the community saying we didn't think that these properties should be contributing, they should be moved to the non-contributing categorization. So from that feedback that we, we got at that session, we released um, a draft for larger public comment back in May and we held a, a larger uh, public meeting on June the 16th where we brought everybody from the community again, and it was a well-attended session. And what we did uh, from the first draft to the second draft is we actually removed uh, three properties from the contributing classification to the non-contributing. And we kind of moved the historic date from, it was around 1945, we moved that back into the 1930s as our cutoff. 
So from that, again, from that feedback over the summertime, we promised the residents that we would not have this public meeting over the summertime because everybody's busy and that we would re-release the guidelines in a later draft uh, around the end of um, August and then hosting a public meeting in the fall. So that's basically the process to date. And I'm going to turn it over now to Dima to just quickly take you through the guidance and then I'll return in a few minutes and I'll talk about the, uh, the issues and the next steps. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to pick up where Scott um, ended discussing contributing and non-contributing properties. And it's important in a district to actually identify which properties contribute to the heritage values of the district. And those heritage values were identified in the study. Because ultimately, what a HCD plan does is manage change in a district in a way that um, still maintains the heritage values. So any of the policies and guidelines that are developed always refer back to those heritage values of the district. And so when we discuss contributing and non-contributing, it's always with respect to those basic heritage values. And as such, there are two sets of guidelines that were um, developed for properties, one for contributing properties and the other one for non-contributing properties. And in addition, there was landscape guidelines that were developed and as well for all properties, there are um, conditions with relating to um, demolition and heritage permits. And these conditions include just general maintenance, recommendations, alterations to properties, additions, and for non-contributing properties, um, completely new developments. Um, additions in general, the the strategy of looking for every policy is when you're discussing a contributing property, it refers back to the heritage values of that property itself and then to the district as a whole. And when discussing a non-contributing property, it refers to how that property would affect the district as a whole. So when we're looking to contributing properties, we're looking that additions be visually and physically compatible with the property, be sympathetic to the building, be distinguishable so that the original reading of that heritage building is maintained. But when we're talking about non-contributing properties, there's a lot more um, leeway and permissibility there because we're, a physic we're ultimately looking for the physical and visual compatibility with the district as a whole. In terms of additions, and here the, the schematics don't indicate scale, but they really indicate positioning. Um, the relationships for, um, this is, would be for um, contributing properties. Um, an understanding of what we mean by compatibility is an idea of side additions or rear additions so the legibility of the original building is maintained um, and the clarity so having a setback or not having a setback or having an addition in front would not be recommended. In terms of scale and massing, um, for contributing properties, again, it refers to not overwhelming the original building so that the original reading of that building is maintained. So we're talking about not devaluing or distracting from the heritage property and maintaining new structures and additions that are simple and maintain the proportional symmetry of the building. That's not to say that the new additions are necessarily smaller, but that they have to maintain and remain compatible. For non-contributing properties, we're looking at that scale and massing, how it corresponds to all the other buildings in the district as a whole, in particular the contributing buildings, as being the sort of the determining factor in appropriateness of scale and massing for non-contributing properties. And there again are examples of recommendations. And we can see here that some of the additions are in fact quite large, but there's a distinction in how that those additions are positioned with respect to contributing properties that maintain the legibility of that original contributing properties and ensure that the contributing property, that heritage historic building, is not sort of under overwhelmed and, um, by the addition and um, that what is being done maintains the heritage value of that property. Some of the alterations go beyond scale and massing, so we're looking to detailing on buildings, and there are policies and guidelines with respect to roof lines, with respect to roof materials, windows, doors, and we have windows here as an example. We discuss porches as well. So we try to identify the elements of a building that really make it identifiable and give it its character. 
For contributing properties, it's a historic building we're talking about, so we're really looking to the maintenance of the principles of conservation, minimal intervention, doing repairing rather than replacing, and maintaining an idea where the original fabric and feature is maintained. So that where we come to protection and maintaining the placement and orientation, the shape and sizes of the historic window openings, and to protect the features, including all the surrounds, the sashes, the scales, the muntins, the hardware. And this also is reflected in our understanding of porches and doors and roof features. For non-contributing properties, um, we're not looking so much to the maintenance of the actual window fabric. The building is non-contributing if somebody wants to change their windows. But we would encourage, certainly, in the development of new designs, that the window scale, massing, the rhythm of the bays reflect in somewhat the other heritage properties in the area so that it fits within the general character. And here again are some examples, um, examples of what elements of the window that we're referring to, but also examples of scaling, traditional scaling of um, glazing proportions and how glazing proportions can really affect the legibility of a window of a building and how it fits in with the general scheme and um, and character of a larger area. And our recommended proportions are 15 to 35 percent glazing within a wall frame. Coming to demolition, um, there are two very different approaches for contributing and non-contributing properties. Contributing properties, the demolition will not be supported. They're considered to be historic and therefore essential to the overall character of the neighborhood. Whereas non-contributing properties or non-historic properties can be demolished. Um, and the demolition um, would be allowed with the approval of a new building to avoid lots, lots being emptied for a long period of time. To facilitate permitting in an HCD, there's a number of works that can be done which are, um, in which the permits are deemed to have been granted. So they're works that don't require um, heritage permits. There's some minor exceptions, but they allow for generally for the maintenance and the day-to-day -day running of a building that, um, that really uh, facilitates uh, homeowners and property owners maintenance and it's important also to note that a lot of the character of the building of what's being protected is what's being protected from the public realm I mean that's an important differentiation so all some of the work that's being done that's in the back for example decks does not immediately concern the heritage area of the building of the building thank you Thanks very much, Dima. And again, uh, at the end of our presentation, uh, your worship and members of council will all be available to answer questions. So if I can't answer all the technical stuff, I know that Dima and Sue can. So just to, um, f a couple of final slides um, and recent feedback and issues. Um, and this is really summarized on, um, on starting on page 696 of the very lengthy agenda tonight. That's where the summary is. And it's also summarized in Appendix B, which begins on page 771. This slide is really trying to capture uh, some of the issues that probably are not completely satisfied to date. Uh, property categorization I've ranked as number one. Um, as Dima mentioned, the real importance of that is the contributing heritage properties uh, are not to be demolished and the non-contributing non-heritage can be demolished. And I just want to throw some figures out here to help council understand um, how this is being viewed in the neighborhood. Right now within the, the category one, two, and three classification, there are 11 properties that say no demolition is allowed. There are 29 properties which state that demolition is discouraged. And there are 26 that basically it's okay to demolish as long as something goes back in that's sympathetic. So the purist would say you have 40 properties there that should not be demolished. And the, what's being recommended in the draft tonight is 27 contributing properties and 39 non-contributing. So the, the folks in the district that don't want to see demolition would, would argue that we've taken this from 40 down to 27. The others that would like to see some de demolition occur would say we've taken it from 11 up to 27. But what we've done, your worship and members of council, we've examined those category two properties, those 29 in great detail, and we've decided to shift 16 of those to the contributing and the other 13 to non. 
Hopefully that kind of simplifies for it. I should have put it up on the chart, but that's kind of where we're at. And you'll hear and you see in the report that we at least have four property owners that would like us to take a second look at how their property is categorized and take it from the contributing to the non-contributing. And when we go back to Heritage Oakville, with our report, we'll be debating those four for sure and maybe others. So that's my promise. The other feedback that we received regarding is guidelines and zoning and how they should work together. And um, I mean, I believe Mr. Johnson's here tonight and will explain probably better than me uh, his concern with uh, guidance and zoning and how they should work together to ensure the scale and massing within the district is appropriate. We're still not quite 100% there on contemporary design. Some love it within the, in the neighborhood and say it should be happening. Others are saying probably not. There's still a few exemptions that people would like to see. Uh, the demolition process uh, and the process itself, there's some suggestions on how that might be tweaked. There's a lot of comment on materials. Um, we have included in the updated guidance uh, additional materials that could be allowed within the district plan, some more contemporary, but to some in the, in the neighborhood, we haven't gone far enough. And there's also some uh, discussion about the practicality of the guidelines. Uh, in, in the heritage world, it's where you have a contributing property, it's always repair before replace. And some of the folks in the community would like to see us a little more flexible. And I'm sure you're going to hear from some of them this evening as well. So we're at the statutory public meeting. That means we're not quite at the end. What we want to do is take what you hear tonight and also the comments that we received. Um, we are going to be uh, presenting a final draft and guidelines to Heritage Oakville on November 17th. And our game plan at this point in time is we will bring back a final recommendation to you on November 30th. And hopefully the, uh, the plan and guidelines will be in, in a shape that you will, uh, will support us. So the recommendation again this evening, it's, it's a statutory public meeting. There's no decisions. It's simply to uh, receive the comments from the public. And again, our whole team is here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Hanna. Uh, are there three that we know? No, five. Three. Pardon? Three. What about under here? What's yes. that? Oh, duplicates. All right. So, Council, we have th at least three interested delegations tonight and, uh, and time for your own questions. Are there questions from you first? Then, Madam Clerk, would you call the delegations? The first delegation is Tula Nassis uh, from Weston Consulting, Planning and Urban Design, representing the owners of 52nd Street. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. I represent the Wilkes, who are the owners of 52nd Street. And if I may just show you where their property is located. <clears throat> the property is located um, south of Union and on the west side of 2nd Street. It's highlighted in yellow here. Thank you. And to respond to staff, they are one of the properties that were moved from the Category 2 to the Contributing and are requesting to be moved out of the contributing to the non-contributing. And if I may show you, the property has gone through considerable renovation and the existing house or the former house is outlined here. The rest of this is all new build. And the, it is, there's, they're still at the two stories. And all of the, these perimeter walls outlined are all new build, as is all of the outlined in the orange color there. Property was designated Category 2 under the um, 1991 uh, First and Second Heritage Conservation District Plan, and largely based on its contextual significance. In the new updated uh, conservation district plan, the property is being moved to a contributing. Or 
Our concern over the change from the existing um, system from the category to the contributing is that the property, um, as is noted in the Appendix A, is identified as having no known uh, historical association with a significant person, group, activity, or event. The property is relevant from a contextual perspective. Um, by moving the property to a uh, contributing, it's moving it to what appears to be to, uh, held to a higher uh, standard from where it is. Um, the former dwelling has been significantly altered and is now subordinate to the redeveloped, as you can see. Um, what, is, what has been maintained as part of the um, original walls is um, the brick veneer that was there as part of the original dwelling. And um, we are asking that it be moved from the um, contributing to the non-contributing given that there is very little that's remained of the original and um, it is subordinate to the um, original dwelling. Thank you for information. Will you be presenting your information to Heritage Oakville as part of this process? We can, yes. Are you aware that we're not making these decisions tonight? Yes. But wanted to voice our concern about being categorized in the um, contributing as opposed to the non-contributing. I, I recommend you um, take full advantage of the process and I'll tell mm -hmm. you that this council um, has a history of having a high degree of respect for the recommendations from Heritage Oakville. So you might want to focus your attention there. Okay. Any questions, council? Thank you very much for your information. Thank you. Madam Clerk, the next delegation. Next delegation is David Johnston. Mr. Johnston, welcome. Council looks forward to your information. Thank you very much, George. Good to be back in front of you all again. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, your worship and members of council, I believe you have a copy of what I've submitted yesterday to the staff, but some of you may not have had a chance to read it with all the other amount of bump you've had for Monday night. So I'll, uh, if you give me a little bit of uh, leeway here, I'll just lead you through with a few additional comments and I'll stick within the 10 minutes. Thank you. My name is David Johnstone and my wife and I have resided at 77 First Street for the past 50 years. We are the longest term residents in the 1st and 2nd Street Heritage Conservation District and maybe even all the old, old Oakville downtown. During that time, I've been active in efforts to preserve the unique historic char character and ambience of the original downtown residential areas and the central business district. <clears throat> Since March, I have actively participated in all the focus group sessions held by town planning staff during the 1st and 2nd Street Heritage Conservation District process review. Until recently, there has been no demolition of homes in the 1st and 2nd Street Heritage Conservation District. For the past 30 years, all redevelopment of properties in this area has been comprised of minor house and garage additions to existing properties. This conservation district is in a period of serious transition. During the past 18 months, four demolition permits have been issued with the imminent probability of two more to come. It is very important at this time that this large amount of redevelopment in a small designated heritage conservation district be accompanied by strict adherence to building bylaws and district guidelines. During the past several years, there has been a significant trend in the older, well-established downtown residential areas, not just our area, in Oakville for purchasers of houses in these areas to demolish the current structure and build a more massive structures. Developers and new buyers want our building lots and our location near downtown, but not our houses. This trend appears to be spreading now to the 1st and 2nd Street Heritage Conservation District. The two major re uh, recent concerns of residents in the 1st and 2nd Street Heritage District are the demolition of older homes and the scale and massing of new development. And you heard this from Scott just a few minutes ago. With the exception of property categorization, the draft plan which he outlined basically is, expands upon and confirms in writing the guidelines, guidelines and criteria which Heritage Oakville Committee has view, been using for the past many years. And this is a real benefit coming from this updated report. Next, I'd like to address the demolition of older houses, older homes. 
The new pro property categorization system reduces the number of residents preserved from, def from demolition from 40 to 27. This was mentioned to by Scott. This is most unfortunate as none of the houses built from 1931 onwards will be protected. Mine, 19, built in 1930, is the last one to be protected. In the last 85 years, none of the houses have been built since that time, even though they have different designs throughout the decades, different styles and everything else, none of those are being protected by this, by this update. Five of the additional 13 properties, which were mentioned by Scott, um, which have been deemed non-contributing, are on the west side of First Street and were built in the 1940s. These five properties comprise five of the six homes on the west side of First Street, all the way from Lakeshore Road down to Union Street, if you know that area. In today's real estate environment, it is likely that all of these smaller homes, which are on larger lots, will be demolished when the current owners, three of whom are retirees, decide to sell. A fourth house has already been sold and is awaiting pr approval for demolition. The effect, long-term effect will be when they're sold, and if they're rebuilt, that only two of the 10 houses on the west side of First Street will have been built prior to 1963. The Romaine House at 41st Street and the Hageman House at 72 First Street, both of which were built in the 1850s. Demolition of this magnitude cannot help but have a major impact on the heritage character of First Street and the total district. Now, scale and massing of new development. The new property categorization system protects only 41% of the homes in the heritage district from demolition. It becomes even more important, therefore, that the zoning bylaw pertaining to new development in this heritage district is appropriate to address the scale and massing concerns of many residents in order to retain the unique character, heritage character of this area. In my opinion, the report does not adequately address scale and massing for new development, and that can be 60% of the properties that are there. The three points under section 4332 on page 40, it's 45, it should be 48, it's a typo, are very general and contain no reference to special provision number 12 that is contained in bylaw 2014-014. Special provision 12 is the primary document which will control scale and massing. In 1984, the town implemented a special provisions bylaw amendment for the 1st and 2nd Street Heritage Conservation District to control massing and retain open space, which we have plenty of, uh, a lot of at the moment in this heritage area. The restrictions in SP 12 pertain to maximum lot coverage, maximum height, and maximum floor area to lot ratio. This special provision bylaw has been, has been included in the new 2014 zoning bylaw with the exception of the provision for a maximum floor area lot ratio, which has been removed. So zoning bylaw 2014 allows unlimited maximum floor area to lot ratio. Um, consequently, maximum um, lot coverage and building height will then remain the major bylaw provisions to control the massing of a residence on a lot. I do not believe the maximum lot coverage and building height criteria in SP 12 will adequately control scale and massing in the Heritage Conservation District. Removal of the maximum floor area lot ratio, in my opinion, encourages the building of two-story box-like houses and allows for greater massing on a property. The current trend for new development in Oakville is to maximum, uh, maximum, maximize lot coverage, re reach the uh, maximum height and, uh, and the floor area. The two-story home currently under construction two doors down from me at 63 First Street at the corner of Union Street has a maximum floor area to lot ratio of 44.7% as opposed to the previous requirement uh, in the bylaw, which uh, 1984, uh, which is a 49% variance in the floor area. So that's almost 50% bigger than what's allowed by the bylaw that time. In addition, the lot coverage has a 22% variance. In relation to the neighboring properties of this junction of First Street and Union Street, this 4,000 square foot new home residence, which is more than two times larger than the, uh, than the house that was there before, is not compatible in scale and massing and substantially changes the streetscape on First Street and Union Street. When you come down First Street and when you come up from the lake, when, the, when those leaves all fall off the trees, you are going to see one massive um, building 
um, at the corner of First Street and Union Street. And it's totally changed already that viewscape, viewscape down, Union, down First Street. I would recommend that you walk by this construction site before the November 30th final meeting to observe the scale of this development, which in all probability will be duplicated in the near future when further demolitions are submitted and approved. They got the variances of 22% and 49%. Why, why won't all the other demolition people want something similar? Because, you know, that was the fourth smallest lot on First Street out of 21 houses, and yet it has 4,000 square feet, which is about the third largest uh, on, in the area on First, only on First Street. In hindsight, I believe that the removal of the maximum floor area to lot ratio requirement from Special Provision 12 has turned out to be a mistake as bylaw 2014-014 now allows for greater massing on a property. I believe that the maximum floor area to lot ratio requirement contained in the old bylaw 1984 SP 327 should be reinstated. The final staff report which will come to you, I believe should recommend a thorough review by town staff of special provision 12 to ensure that this provision adequately provides control over scale and massing and allows former for more creative design. My final point is, if scale and massing of new development are to be adequately controlled in this area, it is critical that the pre provisions contained in Special Provision 12 be strictly adhered to by planning staff and committee of adjustment when considering um, re variance requests for new development. Going back to 63 First Street, if the bylaw had been adhered to and we didn't have a 22% variance in lot coverage and a 49% in, in the ratio, uh, uh, floor area to lot ratio, we would have had a building that was 20% left. I have no argument with the, the design. The design's perfect for the area. It's just too darn big. We'd have a 20% less mass and more open speed to get better view of co coming down to Union Street, actually see Union Street. Can't see Union Street now when you come down, there's a big house you know, blocking off the view of Union Street. And so I really feel that somehow there has to be a mechanism where staff can um, and the planning department and the committee of adjustment can make sure somehow make sure that we don't get these large variances. Ladies and gentlemen, your serious considerations, my concerns, will be greatly appreciated prior to your approval of the final draft plan when it comes to you on November the 30th. And I'd be prepared to answer any questions. Mr. Johnson, thank you very much for bringing your information. I think it's very timely, and I know that several of us, several of us on council. Uh, share your views, and uh, it's it's very good of you to bring them. Uh, Council, do you have questions for Mr. Johnson? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Clerk, the next delegation. Next delegation is uh, Mr. Boyd Waits. Mr. Waite, welcome back. <laughs> it's good of you to spend time with us. <laughs> I was direct. I was showing people the way in the foyer earlier, so, yeah. Um, okay, so good evening. My name is Boyd Waits, Mayor, Mayor Burton and Council. My name is Boyd Waits, President of Oak, Oakville Lakeside Residents Association. Um, the first and second street heritage district falls within uh, my association's boundaries, and I also personally live within the district. OLRA has been involved in the focus groups for this review. Um, we believe that the draft guidelines at this stage, as a result of this review, are definitely an improvement over the existing, in that they do improve upon the clarification and detail of the original, and should lead to less room for interpretation that we have seen in the past. We are concerned, however, about demolition of existing homes um, that are non-contributing and the scale and mass of homes that might be built in replacement. Um, as you know, there has been a fairly extensive um, demolitions and new construction or, or large scale additions and renovations in the last few years in the area. As an example, and I think David mentioned, there have been four demolition permits granted within the last two years. Our concerns on the new development are regarding the scale and massing of what might be allowed in the area. As you know, this is primarily governed by the zoning bylaws. 
and specifically the 2014 uh, in-zone bylaws. And in retrospect, um, having been involved in that process also, we believe there is a flaw in those 2014 bylaws, um, which essentially removed the requirement for the maximum floor area within the, within the district. With this requirement removed, and therefore only maximum lot coverage and maximum height to govern the scale of new development, the new zoning bylaws encourage a two-story home and both stories to be the same size, in other words, a cube-like design. This is generally not what is desired in the Heritage District. We believe the new district bylaws should very clearly state the form and scale of appropriate development in the area in order to protect from maximized massing in that cube-like shape. As a result of this heritage review, we strongly suggest that the 2014 bylaws, specifically Special Provision 12, which, is, which, which covers the first and second street area, be reviewed in parallel to the heritage review with the aim of ensuring the bylaw also supports the type of homes that are desirable in the area in terms of scale and massing and fit well with the surrounding character of the area. And, and that's it, and thank you very much for your time. Council, do you have questions for Mr. Wade? Mr. Wade, thank you very much for your time and your information. Madam Clerk? Are there other members of the public with information for Council on this item? Seeing none, Council, how do you wish to proceed? This is a, as, it, as was explained, uh, this is a receive and, um, and, and wait for the final recommendation report. Councilor O'Meara, are you moving the receipt? Yes, I'll move. Thank you. Discussion, all in favor? Opposed, if any, that's carried. Thank you very much. Now, Council, we have one more public hearing item, and that's item number three on the agenda. So if I could get you to turn uh, back to that. Um, and if you could give your attention to Mr. Thun, he'll lead a summary of the item for the benefit of the public and, and answer any questions that you have as a result of your reading of the detailed report. I'd say go right ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you, Mayor Burton and members of Council. This is a statutory public meeting on a zoning bylaw amendment application submitted by 103 Dundas Corporation for the development of a 208 unit residential building at 103 Dundas Street West. Uh, the report can be found on page 33 of tonight's agenda. Uh, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to obtain any further public input into the application. We have had a public information meeting. Uh, this will uh, also include the public, or public input uh, to the application. We will be returning as staff uh, after a comprehensive review of the application with our uh, recommendation report at a future public meeting. The air photo that's on the above slide uh, identifies the application area in uh, dark lines and its contacts with the surrounding area. And just from that perspective, uh, from the surrounding land uses, we have Dundas Street and detached residential to the south in the old River Oaks community. We have an existing Belf Canada facility to the west. Uh, we have detached dwellings to the north as part of Madame's uh, first uh, subdivision in North Oakville, uh, preserve phase one. And we also have vacant lands owned by Madame to the east. From an official plan perspective, uh, the North Oakville East Secondary Plan designates the subject property as Dundas Urban Core Area, DUC. Section 7652 of the East Plan states that the uses permitted include a full range of office commercial, including retail service commercial, health and medical, institutional, and medium and high density residential. 
Uh, further, Section 7653 states that uh, with regards to densities and heights, the minimum density FSI is 0.5 with a maximum density FSI of 2.5 and heights up to a maximum of eight stories within that Dundas urban core. From the zoning bylaw perspective, uh, the property is zoned ED, uh, existing development. Uh, an application has been made to increase the floor space index or the FSI from 2.5 to 2.75 for the subject property. And the rationale for the increase in the 0.25, it relates to future lands being conveyed to Halton Region for Dundas Street widening. From a development concept perspective, as you can see in the slide, uh, you have an apartment building or apartment building form. 208 units will be a future condominium. Uh, there are 208 units, as mentioned. It is eight stories high. Access will be from Dundas Street West. Uh, the majority of the parking will be underground. There is some, some surface parking, and there's a ramp and an access point from Dundas Street to uh, some parking, but the majority of the parking which will be accessed from where my cursor is, is below grade, and it is two stories of underground parking. We did have a public information meeting on the subject application. That was held on September 3rd. Four members of the public uh, were in attendance. Uh, concerns were raised with regards to height and the form of development uh, from members or from residents along Kading Trail, just to the north. In conclusion, Your Worship, as I had mentioned, today's uh, meeting is to gain further public input into the process. Uh, so staff put forward this recommendation that the comments from the public be received and we continue on with a technical review of the application uh, that has been submitted. Uh, that concludes my presentation, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Thun. Council, do you have questions? Councilor Elgar? Uh, yes, thank you very much to you, Mr. Mayor. What does the official plan uh, say can go there for height? Through you, Your Worship, uh, to Councillor Elgar, eight stories. Okay, thank you. Are there members of the public with information for Council on this item? Mr. Thun, have you, you've taken note of the public's comments uh, that you've received to date, and you'll be addressing those in your final report? Yes, I will, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Knoll? Uh, for what it's worth, I'll just mention that a couple um, uh, Ward 5 residents that uh, were here to talk to this item had to leave and they indicated that they would be uh, sending uh, their comments through to Mr. Thun um, soon after tonight's meeting. Perfect. Um, is that you preparing to move receipt? I'd be happy to move the receipt. Thank you. All in favor? Host of any, and that's carried. You. Council, you have two consent items, item one and item two. Um, and I won't, on the one I brought you, which is support of Halton Hills with regard to Hidden Quarry, I won't. I mean, it's self-evident I won't occupy your time with it uh, uh, if you don't. But. Councillor Duddick is moving the consent items. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, the consent items are adopted. That allows us to move back through the agenda to, as I, as I have kept track, I hope correctly, to item number 11. And uh, I wonder if uh, Councillor Robinson uh, Councilor Robinson, you have your hand up. You have well, the floor. Your Worship, uh, I presume that everybody has read this, and many have probably seen the book that the students have published. This is what it looks like in color rather than photocopy. And I'm very proud of the students of St. Dominic and would, would uh, take great pride in moving the recommendations before us this evening. Thank you, Councilor Robinson, and thank you for all your work on this. Other discussion? All in favor? Opposed, if any, and that carries. Congratulations, Councilor. Um, now, Council, we have uh, confidential discussion item C2 and the advisory committee minutes of uh, Heritage Oakville. Uh, Councillor Duddick? Councillor Duddick, I couldn't quite hear you, but I believe you just moved C2. Discussion, all in favor? Opposed, if any, C2 is adopted. Heritage Oakville. <laughs> well, Councillor, we may have acted just a touch too quickly. 
Mr. Carr, uh, do you have a uh, suitable for the public verbal update? Um, Mr. Mayor, um, I would uh, respectfully request the opportunity to provide uh, advice that's subject to solicitor client privilege um, in a closed session. Thank you. Um, I believe that that was what Councillor Duddock intended to move all along. Absolutely. All those in favor? <laughs> opposed, if any? Madam Clerk, that carries. Madam Clerk, would you um, arrange the chamber for a meeting uh, close to the public for the purpose given? 